Lab Coats, the podcast that undresses scientists. I'm Elodie Chabrol and I can't wait to take you with me to meet the humans behind the research. We will of course talk a little bit about science, but we will mostly talk about them. everyone and welcome to this new episode of Under the Lab Coat. And today, my guest is Davide Tanovi, cell biologist, right? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Davide. Hi, Elodie. How are you? I'm really happy to have you. We met a few years ago on a crazy trip at Google. And since that, you know, I always wanted to have your story. And like every time we meet, you tell me really cool stories about what you do. And now I'm really happy to do the podcast with you. So thank you. Thank you. Um, this podcast always starts with the lab coat on for you to tell me your research. So you have a few minutes. Go for it. Okay. So um, I'm very interested in uh, cellular phenotyping. We do human cell phenotyping. So in a nutshell, we take pictures of cells and we also use other type of um, uh, characterization methods uh, and from the pictures we make sense of the biology of the cells we make sense of the cellular behavior we can kind of understand whether a cell prefers to be uh, surrounded by other cells or alone whether a cell proliferates uh, dies or kind of becomes a certain type of cell or another and uh, this is useful for several application and in particular we work on on stem cells and one type of stem cell in particular is uh, called induced pluripotent stem cells they are embryonic like cells that uh, um, can become any cell type of a body they are basically created from like for example a skin cell that's correct then yes. then you turn into stem cells right yes that's a it's pretty cool uh, thing so we always say to lay audience that uh, a stem cell is kind of juggling between a family and a career in a sense <laughs> because if you decide to self-renew you make copies of yourself and you create identical cell types whereas if you decide to differentiate you learn a function and it's a little bit like becoming uh, a truck driver or okay. or a lawyer or, yeah. a, or a doctor and um, and so when you actually make through reprogramming an induced pluripotent stem cell in a sense, you it's a little bit like you go back in, in your career in time and then you, you can sort of start afresh and become anything. So it's like a truck driver goes back to school and becomes a teacher, for example. Yes, or a teacher goes back and becomes a truck driver, which okay. should be refreshing. Yeah, <laughs> this is really cool. Um, and you said phenotyping. Phenotyping means like what a cell is basically, what she expresses and stuff, right? Exactly. Okay. Phenotyping is from the gr from the Greek uh, pheno, which is kind of like the the appearance so okay. how a cell looks yeah and typically the question is always to correlate the phenotyping to the genotyping so part of how a cell appears depends on what's written in uh, its dna part depends on the environment that it would be like phenotype is blue eyes and it's written in your dna for example but it's more complicated than that for cells well yes but phenotype would be for example brown eyes mm -hmm. but maybe genotype is brown blue okay and so then oh this yes. is why your children one of your children will get blue eyes the other one will get brown eyes so yeah and at a cell level the the way in which the the information is passed is uh intertwined with how the environment shapes it and uh, this creates the appearance of a cell well, thank you. This is super interesting. Um, and I have a question because this podcast is called Under the Lab Coat. But do you wear a lab coat in the lab? And I already know the answer because we are recording it at your lab. And <laughs> I see in front of me <laughs> the answer of my question. But do you so, wear a lab coat in the lab? So, uh, I mean, we are in the office part of a lab. Yeah. So he, nobody wears lab coats on this part. Um, it's It's been a while since I, I kind of regularly wear a, a lab coat to be honest um and yeah now the lab coat tends to be used for tissue culture or other type of um, activities that that require um the lab coat so to be clean basically to be clean yeah okay um so let's 
you don't have a lab coat, but let's imagine you have the lab coat on. We've done the science part of the podcast. So now I would like you to remove that lab coat to talk about you. Okay. So you're doing research on stem cells. Is it something that, or even biology, is it something that you always wanted to do? Or is it something that you discovered with the studies that you've done? So what did you want to do when you were a kid, for example? No, um, I mean, I've grown up in an environment where actually literature was valued much more than uh, than science. Oh, okay. And uh, I've always kind of liked some of the things about physics. Uh, my brother got me a book about black holes at some point when I was fairly young and I really loved it. And, uh, and then I was playing around with um, kind of frogs and uh, a microscope. Uh, so I was able to to actually observe um, tardigrades uh, uh, and and actually you know and that's been really really nice that recently I've managed to to find tardigrades also here in the UK oh <laughs> my god and kind of see and showed my my son too so it's so a way I'm gonna just have a little explanation for people that don't know what tardigrades are you should seriously google it it's basically micro micro animals that are less than a millimeter. So that's why you need a microscope to see them. And they are super resistant to everything, uh, to like heat, um, less like um, missing oxygen, like they resist everything. So researchers are super interested in them because basically they hold the key to survival in a way. Um, so really you can Google them and they, they look really weird. I love them. And actually my new, <laughs> my new thing is that I want a microscope for Christmas to try to get tardigrades. So well, you're, can, <laughs> you're basically it's amazing. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, um, water bears, I think it's yes, water bears yeah, yeah. and they look really cute and ugly at the same time. Okay. So yeah, sure. you, you were looking at tardigrades when you were a kid. Yeah. I was looking at tardigrades and, uh, so kind of. Yeah, what, what not, I was always very attracted by science and by biology in particular, but may, maybe not always, but like from maybe 12, 14 years old. But then I wasn't sure I would I would really follow this path. And uh, up till uh, up till really the end of uh, high school, I I was sort of juggling with several op options and it's only um, on on. Uh, on a beach actually in uh, <laughs> in the in the in the last holiday of of high school that i decided that i would register in to medicine okay and um, so i actually i was just I, I actually just didn't make it on the first test into medicine and then there's been some sort of scramble and i and i sort of got into the the, <laughs> the wow. test. so it's not in high school i wasn't doing much be, beside playing guitar and I wasn't exactly a bright student in high school, uh, but then I got into medicine and I really loved the first uh, three years. Like, uh, so it was such a discovery. First of all, I've you wanted to be a medic then. I, w I was thinking of being a, a neurologist. So okay. like, uh, like, I'm, like, yeah, I was interested in the research part of it, but I, I want, I was thinking I would study the brain, but, uh, the the beginning of um, the first three years of, of medicine were really incredible like um, first of all i've i've kind of understood a bit of physics because in <laughs> um, in high school i didn't understand anything about physics and i thought it was so cool and uh, and then uh, statistics i loved and um, and then we had this big chunk of the second year anatomy physiology and pathology which was especially physiology i had an incredible uh, lecturer yeah. who gave us uh, he taught he taught us to do logarithm in your head right so you can ask me a number I can give you a base okay. 10 logarithm and it's actually really I mean <laughs> it, it's not the most useful skill but but sometimes it is useful when you see graphs etc yeah. and, and and I mean just to tell you he was uh, a professor of physiology but he had this kind of very big wide range of interests and uh, and yeah, I have very fond memories of him. Uh, but, but around the, 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 the third year, basically there was a shift into, this, into the clinical specialties. Yeah. And there I began to, th there, there is when I went uh, to Sweden and that was an okay. incredible experience uh, for uh, an Erasmus uh, exchange program. I, and I, I discovered the lab and, uh, and that was fantastic. But then I came back and I kept kind of studying the physiopathology of the diseases and and then uh, uh, in the exams they would say okay this is great but like how does the patient show up and i would say 
oh sorry i'm gonna be a scientist I don't <laughs> <know where you're laughs> it's like, sorry i realized but why sweden so you, you you didn't explain that why did you go to sweden so there were different options and actually one was incredibly king's uh, college in london okay where you are right now we, where, where we are right now and i think uh, i have i had put I, i remember it was london but i'm fairly sure it was king's but i i had put that as my first option But then there was some sort of uh, change in uh, in how the grants were distributed. And uh, I got this phone call saying, uh, I have a chance to send two people to Sweden and not one. So do you want to go with okay. Sweden? And I said, yeah. And it sure. was like a lab thing then? Yes, it was an entirely lab-based project in uh, Stockholm, in, uh, in the south part of Stockholm. Uh, so based on the Karolinska, but... Okay. <laughs> yeah, we all get, if I, I get carried away with Sweden because I love it so much. But um, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Yeah, so this is when you discovered research, yes, basically. Yes, this is when I discovered the actual lab. And this is when you decided, okay, um, medicine, maybe not, I want to be a researcher. Exactly, exactly. So I came back uh, from Sweden um, and I I registered in Milan in, in this incredible, incredible place that was the European Institute of Oncology and still is. And uh, that was really, but I think in those years it was an, a particularly stimulating environment because we, um, it was very, like th the groups were really kind of merged together. Okay. Uh, it was a really nice vibe. And I, I, I started just simply coming to the lab on a, uh, I think it was on a Wednesday afternoon. I would stay till kind of late-ish. Uh, And then on a Thursday morning, I would run my, my gel to test that the preparation of DNA was uh, yeah. okay. And then I would participate to their departmental seminar they were having every every Thursday at 9 a.m. So it was uh, it was kind of um, an initial gradual experience. Okay. okay, so after that you decided research, so you had to switch from medicine to a PhD basically, or how did it go well, there? Yeah, so I was the first one in medicine together with another colleague of mine to to sort of do an internship in uh, this institute. But then uh, they got us a thesis that w we managed to sort of do an experimental thesis in, okay. in medicine. Okay, uh, which, uh, so you have an MD or a PhD? I have an MD and uh, okay. at the end of the MD I started to work there um, and there was a sponsoring establishment agreement with the Open University, so I got a PhD okay. from there. But I, I always stress that it's a very different experience from the sort of clinical fast track that you have here in the UK where you typically can't run Western blots and... Uh, <laughs> and so those are the you. names of experiments. Yeah. <laughs> people hate you in the lab because you're like... Uh, yeah, it's, it's true. When you're a scientist and you have um, medics in the lab, it's always really weird because it feels like the They haven't been in the lab. Well, they haven't been in the yeah. lab. They discover everything. So I'm always proud when uh, when my colleagues kind of feel very surprised that I'm a medic by training because I I think I think I I did get the the sort of sense of the human body that physiology mm. and anatomy and pathology can give you, but I then rebuilt from scratch all the biology and the biochemistry and the genetics. That's that's really cool. And then so basically you had your PhD. Did you so you were in London? Where did you start your studies? Was it in Italy? The PhD was was an English PhD okay. in Milan. Okay. So with this with this <laughs> yeah. agreement with okay. the, yeah, and then I moved to the UK. I had a project in UCL. Uh, where I sort of run my own uh, uh, phenotype screening um, in in a lab in UCL, continued in uh, Cambridge, uh, and and that was a very good uh, stem cell lab, uh, and I was jointly funded by a company at that point. Okay. And this, I mean, if you're talking about kind of sliding doors in yeah. careers, etc., that was uh, a very interesting moment because. I was also recruited as a business fellow for this London Technology Network. Okay. And we were receiving uh, kind of queries from industry that we had to pitch to university. Okay. Which was really interesting for me. Like, we were not selling stuff. Yeah. We were simply sort of thinking, okay, this company needs a glue, not, not for the department. This company needs something related to stem cell. Oh, yeah, I can take this and see if there is some group of scientists that are interested in linking with them so you kind of develop this technology brokerage mm -hmm. which is a concept that is i think totally underrated but but it's very interesting because it gives you possibility to sort of start thinking um 
from what angle somebody comes and from what angle somebody somebody else comes, especially in mm. academia and by and I think culturally it, it's still st stuff that fascinates me every day, and and so that was um, that was a project that continued again in UCL now at the Cancer Institute. Uh, there was very interesting stuff we were doing that is actually now really sexy. It's kind of <laughs> like we were taking cells from brain tumor patients and uh, uh, we were correlating the response of the cells to a drug with the genetic oh, background. Okay. So again, it's a bit genotype, phenotype yeah, yeah. type of studies. And uh, so that was uh, that project. And uh, and now uh, even for, for something different, I, I jumped off uh, the academic track uh, after this and I decided to be a principal scientist in a s very small startup for some time. And we were based uh, initially in King's Cross and then next to Stevenage, next to GSK in Stevenage. And around that time when we were kind of getting funding, but it wasn't 100% sure, I got in touch with uh, Fiona Watt, who yeah. um, has been my line manager until very recently here. And um, she was building this new center and I sort of was very interested and I, I got the chance to work with her, which was brilliant. And also to develop uh, quite a big project without some, some independent scientific, I was kind of, you know, in a sense, I was kind of executing her vision on yeah. a big project, but it was a, it was an interesting position because I was, I had more resources than a young PI from okay. one point of view, but at the same time, I was also considered a bit of a glorified technician by others. <laughs> so it, it, it's interesting. And so yeah yes, sorry I'm, I'm sorry yeah let's recap for for people so <laughs> basically um so you started medicine then you discovered research and you did uh, you had your md then you did the phd then you went into the research branch um and you did some research etc uh, etc et lots of things and now that's what we're going to talk about is uh, you're doing research in academia you're a lecturer right yeah i'm a senior lecturer here at king's okay but you're not just doing that. It's just 100%, not 100% academia anymore for you now. Well, so this all happened in, uh, so I, all, I've all, I was always very interested in this space between academia and industry and even in the work I, I was doing here. But then during the, the, the times when the world collapsed in 2020, <laughs> I, I kind of got in touch with um, this um, interesting place in London called Open Cell. And mm -hmm. they have been building this idea of creating modular labs in shipping containers. Okay. And to be honest, at the point where testing was actually needed locally, okay. I thought it was brilliant what they had because you could put on a truck a modular lab, you can send it to Cornwall or, or But like wherever. a proper lab. Like a proper small lab that, that can simply do PCR reaction uh, from, from test, but using liquid handling. Okay. And so like... Uh, reactions and stuff yeah yeah but sim like f for the point of view of testing for a pandemic yeah. i thought it was it was very relevant yeah and actually was really touched by one of one of a tweet that they had that sort of said somebody explained to me why uh open trans give us robots to sort of run this but we struggled to get pcr kids from academia yeah and i was thinking well and actually you know they're gonna be closed for months now so and it's partly cultural this kind of idea that academia should not do these things in shipping container right yeah. it, like th there's still a, a bit of a gap between academia and innovation in that respect and so that really kind of resonated deep and so i got in touch with them i helped them raising uh, money with innovate uk at the end we we managed to sort of help um, making a prototype um, ultimately that project got completed so there are these these uh these shipping containers that that work and it, it, it is a solution that can be can be considered for for this type of needs and at the same time i was sort of thinking that i wouldn't i wasn't a hundred percent an academic and i yeah. would never be a hundred percent academic and i would be probably sad if i sort of got completely in that track and so um this is uh in, in the summer of 2020 I, I did get uh, my senior lectureship um, and then shortly afterwards I got a formal offer from uh, Bitbio, which is an amazing company based in yeah. Cambridge and uh, we now do um, every cell type. Okay, so now you're working Bitbio and Kings. So how much, like what is the life of a scientist that is divided into? So how do you do because you're Cambridge and London? 
Yeah, it's quite actually split at the moment because also I live in London in an area that is very uh, buzzing and, and then in Cambridge we are in the middle of the countryside. <laughs> and, uh, so I run in the morning with the uh, hares and uh, reindeers occasionally. Oh, nice. But, no, it's lovely. Um, but so um, it works. I mean, it worked uh, very simply when it was all remote in a sense, but then uh, now it's really nice to... Um, to sort of uh, take care of the two teams and uh, and spend time. So you're um, physically going, well, in Kings, yes, we're here, <laughs> yeah. and to Cambridge. Um, how do you divide your time? Oh, it changes, but like generally I'm in Kings one day a week and okay. uh, the rest of the week I'm in uh, uh, Cambridge and the weekends are a bit kind of mostly in London, but occasionally there. <laughs> So it depends if you want countryside or exactly. if you want cities, like exactly. eh, maybe more. Yeah. Okay, and w what do you do there in that company? Is it completely different work? No, it's a, it's a very similar type of methods. Uh, we are just very focused on the things we do in Bitbio, which um, deals with obtaining from these embryonic-like cells virtually any cell type of a human body. And we uh, kind of get interaction with our colleagues, uh, scientists, uh, and, and some kind of come to us saying, can you tell me if this is a neuron? And we sort mm. of say, well, actually, yes, based on images or flow cytometry. And others actually ask us to develop methods to to be able to identify one particular cell type out of many. And then we also run the instruments and we train the people and we make sure that the infrastructure in terms of data is, is up to speed, etc. So it's basically more or less, yeah, the same work. It's, f it's funny because often in people's mind, you know, academia is very different from company. It's, it's, you know, you're doing very different work, but you're doing more or less the same thing. It's just different goals. Look, the, the best uh, analogy I've ever <laughs> had was uh, um, from one of these people the mentoring in the London Technology Network. And uh, he said, uh, you have to think a little bit like the lyrics and the tune of the same song sometimes. Okay. And uh, yeah, uh, it is very different. It's extremely different. Um, but it's fascinating how things can work together. The other the other analogy that I think works <laughs> very well, that uh, it's another another legacy of the pandemic because um, uh, my son was playing a lot of Rubik's Cube around the time. <laughs> uh, it, so it's that if you think about academic, clinical and commercial as three completely different dimensions, when your career moves on one, you kind of have to re-scramble a little bit okay. <laughs> to others. Uh, or even when, when your experiments kind of work one, think about, think about like the decision whether to publish or to patent something, etc. Yeah. So there's always some sort of jiggling across the three dimensions. Yeah. That's cool. So actually, I like managed to have the perfect Rubik's cube. Well, I'll tell you in a few years. Hopefully, <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm I'm very excited about this phase. Definitely, it's always challenging, um, but I think uh, but I think it's quite good to be able to relate to. Uh, it's very enriching to be able to relate to the two different communities. You wouldn't leave one uh, if you had to leave one. No, I mean it would be too hard, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. We'll see what, what, what. I think that the big message is like when you are too strategic about choices. Yeah. I mean, this is not my, and you know, this is from an Australian comedian I've, I've heard on YouTube. Uh, you kind of miss the opportunity on the corner of your eye. That yeah. sort of. So I always encourage people to think about what you like to do tomorrow and the day after, but not not kind of think strategically in terms of five things. In academia, it's very annoying because strategy also equals like, uh, you know, flirting with big groups uh, <laughs> or sort of kind of asking top yeah. down things yeah. to happen. So f luckily that, that aspect I've really kind of set a little bit more free from. Okay. Uh, biotech has its own weird stuff too, but, uh, but I find, uh, Maybe I maybe I don't know it that so well. And no, I but it's a, it. it's a nice balance. It's nice to you know to to talk to someone that doesn't do hundred percent academia or hundred percent company. Um, so it's nice to you know see the differences and see that it's not that different after all. And uh, the, m I'm more amazed by the fact that it's like Cambridge and London, and you have to go back and forth. You know, and yeah, it's like that's oh. not too bad. It's like an hour yeah. twenty by car, so it's fine. And, and you can enjoy the countryside. Yeah, you can enjoy the countryside. So, yeah. and we're going to slip to actually the subject, the last subject of the podcast is what do you do when you don't work? 
So you said you're running early in the morning, right? Yes, I do. I run early in the morning. These days I'm actually on a really kind of <laughs> weird timetable. So I I really kind of go to bed with the sun and I wake up with the sun okay. when I'm in Cambridge, which is a bit sad sometimes, but, but <laughs> I love it. And uh, and then I around after lunch, I kind of need a nap. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the weekends, I can even nap. But, but yeah. 5 30 to 6 30 i have found these incredible little streets in the middle of corn fields and uh, and it's such a nice way to start your day so you run with uh, little animals like hair yeah. and, and this yeah. is like yeah. i'm very jealous of you right now oh, it no, must be it's, super I mean, peaceful in the should, morning you should come and check it out it's it's and also w what i like is that hair is typically they they well we have this uh in in the abraham campus we have this kind of robotic lawn mower yeah and the hairs interact with, uh, <laughs> with the robot. It's, it's something kind of out of Star Wars. And <laughs> the other thing they do is they gather in the morning in groups. And I always have the impression that they plan their day. <laughs> <laughs> They're plotting for whatever's next. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, you, you're saying you're running. You, you're running. You're doing some big runs. I think you've done I, one not I've long done, ago. Well, yeah, I've done half marathons. I'm, I'm really pathetic in, in terms of speed. Yeah, but you're doing it. Yeah, but but um, <laughs> it is good. Yeah, I, I I quite like the ten kilometers. That's quite okay. nice. But the, the, I've done half marathons many, but I I've, sometimes I finish then thinking I'm gonna do a full a marathon full? one yeah. day. Sometimes no. I finish thinking I'm never gonna do one again. I'll I'll keep, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the ten kilometers. But no, I, it's nice. Okay, and what else do you do? Uh, well, I, I mean, I like music. I'm not... Uh, so you were playing guitar, you said, when I, you were I, younger, right? Yes, I've been playing a lot of guitar in high school. Um, what kind of guitar? Well, initially I've been playing like this sort of acoustic guitar that every yeah. Italian guy <laughs> kind of plays. Um, then I have sort of learned a little bit how to play the electric guitar. Uh, okay. But, I mean, pathetic. But, nah. but I quite like... Um, I quite like to sort of sing along with people and like uh, not so much karaoke. Okay. Because I find karaoke a bit limiting in terms of uh, your <laughs> individual freedom. <laughs> but I quite like to sort of jam sessions and stuff like that. And occasionally, like even last week, we had one nice. at work, uh, like kind of random. And yeah, you like have you take your guitar and yeah, you sing together. Exactly. And people play well, people don't play. And it's it's kind of. It's uh, it's all good. This is pretty cool. Around the fire, you know, that's the best. Yeah, we didn't have the fire last week, but yeah. Was it in Cambridge yeah. or in Cambridge? In Cambridge. In Cambridge. Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, that's that's nice. Uh, Anything else? Because <laughs> <laughs> I know some stuff, but I think I'm not um, supposed to talk about that. So. Oh what? Did, so in actually in Saifu, I did play the bass. Do you remember? Oh, you in uh, in Google. Yes, yes. We had these sessions there. So yes. that, that kind of stuff I really like. Yes. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, for for so I we I explained quickly at the beginning that we met uh, at Saifu. So Saifu is a crazy gathering organized by um, Google, Nature, Digital Science, and O'Reilly of scientists and science communicators and writers and journalists and everything. And it's just really crazy because the idea is to network as much as you can during three days. And the Saturday night usually is a very chill night doing, playing um, like games and guitar and everything. And yeah, you, we were <laughs> it was quite fun. Like yeah, and, and networking is one mile away from not working, remember it? yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was great yeah and it was great to meet yeah yeah so yeah that's true you were playing guitar there um yeah another hobby anything no not much i like playing chess i Ooh. do play chess okay yeah. uh i i used to play more and uh, then actually used to play with a high school mate of mine okay but then he started kind of playing for real and and then it was and too it much. Became, yeah, it became annoying to play together because I was always losing. Do you play uh, with your son then? A little bit, yes. Yeah. But again, he's he's kind of catching up now. <laughs> he's and getting and too yeah. good. <laughs> um, but I like I like chess. I always I always feel it's a bit like REM sleeping. It's uh, it's kind of rewiring oh, yeah. your brain in in a in a weird way, and uh, I I really like it. I, I really like especially after dinner to sort of okay chill out yeah, and chill out. Uh, you have your chess. You. Okay, um, thank you for sharing all that. We are arriving to the end of this 
episodes. Thank that you. Was really fast. I have one last question oh. for you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I thought it was over, but it's not. No, it's um, do you have anything before we finish that you wanted to say we didn't talk about, or like a last, you know, thing, like a last? Like, so no one word thing, or something? one message I would like to to share with is. I do think there are some structural problems in uh, in the current academic environment that are probably bigger than than a single person to tackle or or, or like uh, and kind of require some sort of understanding and, and awareness and uh, and I think for example um, we should we should nurture a community that should not be so different from uh, the equivalent professionals in other environment think mm. about the difference between the way people say my PhD student and how st stuff like this would never be allowed in uh, like, I don't know, finance or, mm. or even or even other kind of work. So so I think we, we should sort of challenge that some of th some of the cultural, aspects, not not everything because academia is great, but but some of, th of the cultural aspects from within in a sort of maybe maybe not not necessarily revolutionary way, but m maybe in, in a sort of gradual, gradual change. Uh, And I think, in a sense, biotech could teach some of this stuff to to academia, and and I think um, finding this sort of uh, alignment of the goals is the real secret for impact. Because ultimately, you want to have critical mass of thinking, and you want to have sort of deliverable and and development rather than sort of pure pure knowledge. Uh, And I don't think every scientist should be a translational scientist, yeah. but I think if you want to embark in this journey, then do it for real and like uh, kind of try to do it bottom up and, and, and sort of try to think about what works uh, um, and what will create an impact. Well, thank you for that last message and thank you for this episode. And I will put in description where to find you and everything if people want to reach out and discuss with you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye. 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 That's it for this episode of Under the Lab Code. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to rate the podcast on the platforms, to share it around, and to subscribe. Thank you. Thank you.